I'm a professor in the University of Yaoundé and uh, also an ambassador for peace for the African Union and uh, also a senior electoral expert for the United Nations and African Union. So I'm very pleased to be with you today because we are going to have a great conversation on the, with, on, with the African filmmakers and academics that we are. So Eli, everybody, are you there? Yes, we are indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So today as participants, we have Samira Vera Cruz from Capo Verde. We have Jean-Pierre Bacolo from Cameroon and uh, Emeka from Nigeria. So I would more than happy for you to introduce yourself. And then we will go with the focus of the day because our conversation and discussion will be about cultural identity and ownership for shaping mindset. It's a one hour conversation. So I think we will take like five minutes for each participant to introduce itself. And then we'll go deeper into the debate, if you all agree on that. Sounds good. Should I start? <laughs> So I'm Samira Vera Cruz. I'm a filmmaker from the Cabo Verde Islands. I've already directed and produced two short films, one fiction and one uh, documentary, uh, and one feature film done entirely without financing, which was crazy, but we did it here in Cabo Verde. Um, right now, I'm also coordinating the film and audiovisual network for the Portuguese-speaking African countries trying to change a little bit the reality of filmmaking in our region and trying to make it a, a more fair and, and dynamic uh, environment for the filmmakers of our region. I, I also teach in some universities here in Cabo Verde, mainly script writing and film uh, post-production. Oh, great. Very happy. Welcome, Samira. We are happy to Thank be with you. you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, Jean-Pierre Bucolo, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Okay, so my name is Jean-Pierre Bucolo Obama. Uh, I'm Cameroon filmmaker. I've uh, been doing this for quite a long time. I spent time teaching in North America at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and also at Duke University. Mm -hmm. I've been also doing exhibitions, feature films, science fiction, uh, comedies, uh, TV series. So, voila. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this uh, short introduction. And then... I will be more than happy to see uh, Mr. Emeka. If, are you done, Jean-Pierre, or? I'm ready. To, yes, uh, my name is uh, Ed Emeka Kizo. I am, uh, well, I, I'm an historian fundamentally, but um, I use film, documentary film, as a vehicle of publication. Um, I have, uh, I, you know, I, my focus essentially is on myth breaking in African history and uh, essentially exploring narratives of, you know, hidden narratives. Um, I've, I have uh, produced, so far, I've, I've produced uh, seven films, virtually one every single year since my first film in 2014. And we, um, luckily, we got uh, nominated for the AMA yesterday. We've won a couple of awards for a document, our most recent documentary called January 15, Untold Memories of the Nigeria Biafra War. So what we try to do is we're focused on real stories of, or in African history and its highlighting and changing a narrative as far as that is possible whilst keeping a realistic tab on the historical content. And that, in, in essence, is uh, who I am and what I do in this space. Oh, great. Very interesting. Thank you, Emeka. So maybe I would... Before we, we go further, maybe I'll go back with the context of this conversation. Um, in two, 2021, the African unions really raised a focus on the art, culture, and heritage, a lever for building the Africa we want. It was actually a central discussion during the 34th Assembly of the Member State of the African Union. And um, 
actually what we want to understand from your experience as filmmakers, academics, because some of them are both filmmakers and academic is how, um, how art, cinema, film can contribute to the development of Africa. How can it be used as a tool, a tool for economic development? Maybe with your experience in the past, the film that you have been making, it, uh, it was used maybe as an instrument for political change. I see the biography of Jean-Pierre Bocolo, and I also know that Emeka, you are an, histor you are an, an historian. So I think all the, the, your work reflects your ideology. And uh, I mean, we are all African coming from different parts of Africa. So how can we build something for our, our continent? Maybe I will give the floor to <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Eka first. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. You didn't get that? I, I didn't hear, I, I lost you for a second. I didn't hear, I didn't hear the last bit of what yeah. you said. Apologies. Oh, I wanted to, to first, you know, to, 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 to start the debate on how can we use this cultural identity to, to build up our continent, Africa. Oh. And we can, we can raise it from different sides, economic, politically, socially. Okay. With your experience, because you are a filmmaker, a great writer, so okay. how do you see it? Okay, brilliant. Um, to be honest, the, one of the reasons why I chose film as a vehicle of conveying history was for the very simple reason that one, in, you know, starting from my immediate ecosystem in Nigeria, literary culture, the reading culture had been dim uh, diminished by economic uh, circumstances going back 30 years. So that the reading culture, which had been well established, you know, going back even as well as going back even 100 years, you know, uh, within the modern Nigerian state was depleted. Now, with the revolution, the social media revolution, film began, became one of the biggest vehicles of conveying information uh, for a people who had lost so significantly the reading culture. Now, with great power comes responsibility. You as a filmmaker, as, uh, you know, as Fela Kuti, one of our famous, uh, said, look, art cannot simply be about enjoyment. Even art within the historic, Afri uh, art within the, uh, should I say, performance art, even within the African context, is not just about entertaining and making people happy. It is about your your basically song and dance has always been a vehicle for recording history, for recording epochs in history and conveying that and transmitting that through the generation. So that film is simply a next phase in that whole culture of storytelling within the African context. And not just storytelling within just as in fiction, but storytelling within the culture of the griots. You we are so that this film is the, one of the most important vehicles for transmitting information. And as I said, with great power comes responsibility. The filmmaker has a responsibility, even within the context of uh, feature dramas, you know, to convey a story, to convey the truth, as it were, or indeed to ask important questions within the broader framework of the African continent. That, is, in effect, is one of my approaches. Thank you, Emeka. Really, um, we are going to discuss with all the opinion. I want to know what Samira thinks about this. Yes. A film for, for convening information and uh, actually transforming our societies. I absolutely agree. Um, we belong to this class of storytellers and, and we in our entire continent and being as different as we may be from one origin to the other, because it is a huge continent and we cannot forget that. Um, we belong to this class of storytellers. We have something to tell. And film cannot, uh, as you said, cannot be just like pretty images. Of course, pretty images. Now we are in an era where with a cell phone, you can get an amazing image. You can, But what does it tell? What do you have to say? What do you have to to share why are you making a film? And that is fundamental because when you show, and me coming, especially from Cabo Verde, which from its origin is a mixed country from the very beginning, we have questions of identity. Where do we place ourselves? We're in the islands. Uh, we come from a mixed background. We have all this history. We have all the history that we are told in schools, 
but we have all the other history that was lost from the Fula, from the Mantaku, that came here, that were brought here against their will. And we end up not knowing all of that. So I absolutely agree. It is a huge responsibility because we have all of that to tell and film is a key to talk about those matters, to, to talk about what worries us. And with this question of identity, to me, it was very important from the very beginning to film in Creole, not in Portuguese, not in French, not in English, even though to me, language is only a, a medium of communication, but it belongs to our identity. So it was very important to shoot in Creole to show people from our country in their different colors and body types and everything and genders and have our language. So absolutely, film is a major tool to change our societies, to talk about our matters of identity and so many other things. Okay, Samira, thank you for yeah. sharing your uh, enthusiasm as a storyteller. And for now, we all agree. So maybe Jean-Pierre, uh, <laughs> Sophia will give us a different insight or on this <laughs> of film as people for conveying information. Okay. What do you think? Okay, thank you, Felicité. So what I want to to say first is that okay, maybe because I was the first African to make the first African science fiction film. Science wow. fiction is about speculation. It's about asking the what if question, meaning opening what is not there yet. So, when you ask the what if question, you are creating a reality that is not there yet. So, the big question for the future and for our youth is how can we get something we cannot see? You cannot get a car unless you have a concept of a car. So, cinema is opening up, is making almost bringing up the invisible, is making real something that is not there yet. So uh, I kind of feel that our youth and our people are prisoners of the reality of reality. Meaning, and when we know that reality doesn't exist, really, we kind of, with our belief in reality, crystallizing it, making it happen, while reality is just an illusion. So I think in that sense, cinema has this potential of helping a new generation to project itself in an Africa they wish to have. Another point is that, um, and that's a new concept I've been working on for the last two years. Uh, I call it healing cinema. It was just, it was before Corona, so it's nothing to do with <laughs> the pandemic. So the healing cinema, uh, because we as Africans have lived the trauma uh, of colonialism. If you just mm -hmm. take the case of the idea of bleaching, bleaching mm -hmm. is actually clearly proving that, you know, we are, have a shame, we are ashamed of ourselves, we are ashamed of our blackness, you know, and bleaching is such a big phenomenon on the continent. So cinema can deal with those kind of issues, meaning anything that has to do with low esteem, uh, low self-esteem. Uh, um, mm -hmm. We, in fiction fame, we create characters people identify with and would like to kind of be like them or look up to. So uh, it doesn't matter how good or bad is a person, and even people can even identify with bad characters. So just to say that cinema has this device, it's kind of this device that could help uh, boost self-confidence. And in my healing cinema concept, we are dealing with, obviously, trauma, as I said, and the question is always, why do you think children love so much superheroes? Yeah? Children love superheroes because they are small. They are very weak in the world of adults where they feel very intimidated. And not just children, but everybody who has been traumatized is looking for what uh, Boris Sioni called the rehabilitating hero. So this rehabilitating hero is there to help fill the gap because the trauma is like a, is like a, 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 call it a cliff. You, know, you have to jump, you know? To from one end to the other end without falling down. Anyway, so it's very important to know that cinema is playing that function. And I was my theory was proven by Black Panthers because 
what made people, black people, love Black Panthers is not about the facts, you know, because, but it's mainly about the whole idea of boosting our self-esteem. It means that it doesn't matter what we say, we still live under a kind of complex of inferiority that was inflicted to us to, with colonialism. So that's one aspect. And the last thing I'll just say, but that's maybe not that important, but is the fact that a lot of young people want to do this. They want to make films. You know, what are we going to do with them economically? You know, what are we going to do with them? And I always take the case of Boko Haram. Do you know that, for example, uh, I think we look at, I don't know, it was like 1,000 films that were made in Nigeria, the year of Boko Haram. None of them saw Boko Haram coming. None of Nigerian films, out of Nollywood, out of 1,000 films, could show us Boko Haram. So what does it mean if cinema cannot show? Hmm? If cinema cannot show you what is happening around, that could be dangerous. It means that cinema is distracting you. And in French, mm -hmm. they use the term diversion, divertissement. Fair diversion is actually making you look left when somebody is telling you right on the right side. So it means that we have to be careful about that cinema that becomes a distraction, a distraction meaning a, a, a big phenomenon can come like Boko Haram, but we are busy watching something else. And cinema is supposed to show us. That's the whole point, to show what we cannot see. Voilà. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Um, as for myself, I totally agree with what you said. And it's very important, the comparison that you made with uh, Black Panthers, because actually what we realize is that films are using our imaginary, but it also works on the collective uh, awareness. And what, what it reveals is that film is working with history because it raises a work of memory. And I see that all of them, I see the, that Samira, she, and maybe she will discuss more about that. She did a, a film, a psychological thriller, and um, raising this, and you even Cartier, and you even Cartier Mozart, there was, there was something matching it, in it. So make it more uh, concretely on what you did in your film to see the relation with the, 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 the speech of today. But you know the conversation that we have today, uh, we should be aware that it's just something that is uh, that we are we are putting with the agenda 2063 of the African Union. It goes end in end with that. And in this agenda, it's very simple. Uh, the AU aspiration is to promote self freedom, progress, and you know. But we are into that since the 1960s, which means after the Les Indépendances, huh? as, as we said in French. So now, concretely, because, you know, the first part of our debate was a bit like uh, abstract with, you know, nice view on the, um, how you see your image and your universe. But now let's try to go to the point on um, how can film can play a crucial role to catalyze the social economic development. Because you filmmakers, you're organizing, maybe you're participating to festivals that are creating jobs, you know, because we need jobs to progress. So the second point of um, our conversation today is really, how can this film, the heritage that goes along, can work for economic transformation? Mm -hmm. Maybe Emeka wants to start now, and uh, we will see with uh, Samira and Jean-Pierre after that. Yeah. Um the reality is that if, I mean, Nigeria is the best, perfect case study for the use of film as an economic catalyst, you know, the catalyst for economic growth. The reality is that, I mean, apart from whatever ills or whatever negative traits Nollywood may possess, and I promise you that Nollywood has its critics within the Nigerian uh, cultural framework, you know, Jean-Pierre identifies the failure to identify, the failure to put a, a finger on the, on the pulse of major social political events that impacted not just on Nigeria, but on the sub-region. But anyway, I digress. The fact is that Nollywood has its good points because the reality is that not at, the, at the end, it was the tail end of the first lockdown. There was a, a documentary, a, a film, I beg your pardon, a drama was released in the cinemas, one of the first films to come out in the cinemas called Omoghetto, which grossed about half a billion naira. Now, we can... For me, for, for, for me, for us champagne socialists, we'd be like, yeah, why should... No, well, the reality is this. An industry that employs 
thousands and thousands of people, which provides employment, both in, in terms of domino effect, for close to a million people in Nigeria. It's no joke, because people supply the welfare, the logistics, and so on and so forth. It is a multi-million dollar industry. So the reality is that Nollywood is a perfect case study for something that grew from, you know, literally, it's almost like when you take an orange seed and you throw it into, you know, throw it away, and then you come back six months after and you see something coming up. They see an economic uh, trick tr coming. So it is a catalyst, but the reality is how can this be done? How can we democratize? How can the, because the reality is if we're all waiting for film grants from America, if we're waiting for film grants from the BFI, where do we start? Now, I was in a, um, a, a, a seminar, a webinar, I beg your pardon, uh, over the weekend. And there was a conversation about the use of media for national development. Now, we left all the airy fairy talk and we came down to the brass tacks that you have requested us to do now. The reality is that when you have Nigerian filmmakers running to South Africa to benefit from tax breaks and grants, and when the environment in Nigeria in particular is so difficult to work in. Look, let me tell you categorically that 80 70% of my films have been self-funded. Oh. Without question. Yes, self-funded. Because if I was waiting for <laughs> assistance from Nigeria, I would probably, my beard would be white than it is now. <laughs> it, will, <laughs> it will grow there because they really, the support is not there. In fact, everything, and I'm going to say this now, Almost as if everything is set as an obstacle for many filmmakers in many parts of Africa, and Nigeria is a perfect case study. People have succeeded in spite of, not because of governmental support. So the reality is that if government could just take a step back and think, well, hang on, this is actually a revenue earner. Oil is going. Nigeria has used oil as its shield, knight in shining armor. Oil is going down. Fracking has killed the oil <laughs> price, and even the, the last year when oil tankers were virtually at standstill showed us our vulnerability. The future is in the cultural sector. And film, as I said, is not, I'm not, it's not an abstract concept. The Nollywood is one of the biggest revenue earners. Look, Nollywood, the soft power of Nigeria is, has been Nollywood and beats. So, and it's just a, 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 a so to round up, it's not just a, an airy fairy phenomenon. This is, this is a pure brass tax. This is empowerment, financial empowerment. It's cultural empowerment. You know what I mean? It's economic empowerment for people. So reality is about the government now thinking, okay, hang on, how can we harness this? How can we support this? How can we build on this? So that our, our filmmakers don't have to keep running to South Africa and making, you know, which is an embarrassment, running to, you know, to seek grants from other places. It is an embarrassment. So, and it, Nigeria is just one example of an African nation that has not yet gotten its act together to understand the power, significance, and have the foresight to see that film as an industry is a revenue earner, is a vehicle for national development. So, look, I don't know how many other ways I can say this, but I think that you, you probably get my point now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I got you, and maybe I want to uh, Samira because I also <laughs> see that uh, our film was a self-funded. Yes, it was. It so, was. And I for my new documentary, I've been struggling for the past two years to get funding, but we're still doing it, despite of getting the funding or not. Uh, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not even going to start on how bad the situation is for filmmakers in Cap Verde because we don't have a particular tradition or history. Like there were some films that were made in the 50s and then only like co-productions with Portugal and most of them like films in Portuguese. And uh, well, I'm not even going to go into that right now. But um, the thing is, yes, like it is an industry that can bring a lot of money and not only like to the, the crew and cast and everyone who's participating in the production itself, but also like if we think about Cap Verde, which is a country that most of its money does not come from oil, fortunately, I think, but from tourism. Uh, it also attracts tourism, like a different kind of tourism, not only like the resort kind of tourism that you go into a hotel and you, you don't actually see the culture and tradition from the country, but it opens up the country to a different kind of visitors. And being islands, that is very important to us, this exchange uh, between us and the rest of the world. 
But to add on this, and, and specifically because you talk about my film, Sukuru, which means darkness, it is a psychological thriller talking about a young man who's schizophrenic and starts using crack cocaine. So everything, uh, well, it's his point of view, so it's a very dark and intense uh, film from this character's point of view. And what we do when we tell such stories about such themes that here and in other African countries as well are taboos, we don't talk about them. We don't discuss mental health. We don't discuss drug abuse. It's, it's very taboo. And you let, but it does exist. You have young people and not only getting lost in those problems. So when you talk about that, when you open up the discussion, when you start actually finding solutions for that, you're also having an impact in economy because you're helping out generations of people that could be lost in issues that we are not talking about yet. So those are all the layers that you have with film and with storytelling and specifically in film because you do impact the econ economy directly with productions and indirectly with all everything that surrounds the production because for instance if we have like an Algerian production now here in Praia you have the hotels the catering everything we all know that you have all those layers of professions that are being helped and you're helping the economy but you also have with the impact that it has through your story and what you're aiming to achieve with it I don't know if I answered your question <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Emeka, you want to add something to comment on Samira's? Oh, I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I mean, she has she has very eloquently de uh, described the situation in her own in, um, ad uh, in environment. I mean, the only thing the only thing I could possibly add is that, you know, just the only thing I, I probably left out was speaking about documentary films in particular, which is what I make. We all know that anyone who is making documentaries is not looking to be a millionaire. <laughs> That's just a fact, you know what I mean? If you're making documentaries, just relax, you know, pretend to be a socialist or a communist and live and go through life the way it is. But the reality is that it does not have to be a loss leader because documentaries in particular are within this context of storytelling, you know, you know, story, story, uh, non -linear, story, storytelling within the African context, an important vehicle, an important vehicle for conveying information. So the moment, the, the sooner we start to wake up and support filmmaking so i mean towards at least whatever outcome be it, be it financial be it otherwise that come from it then you know the better for us but when who knows that's what, that's what I, thought. I couldn't possibly add anything to what samira said this is just my my perspective thank you, thank you. i think maybe jean pierre want to add something on this because uh, from okay. what i know <clears throat> yeah jean pierre told me about an initiative that he, he, he had taken in cameroon with um, offering an opportunity to young people to produce maybe short, short, short film. I think it's a way to contribute to economics. So maybe can you elaborate more on that, Jean-Pierre? The connection, the connection is breaking. I didn't hear exactly the initiative. No, Which no, one I, are you talking about? There are many yes. initiatives, so. Talk about an initiative mm -hmm. in Cameroon, open a place, and um, your aim was uh, to, to allow young people to produce very, very short film. I'm not a specialist, but for me, it's also a contribution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can, okay. you guys, can you share this experience yes. with us? Yes, <clears throat> um, I agree about everything uh, Mekka and Vera said. Uh, uh, what we feel unfair is how hard it is in general in our own countries to make films. I tend to always feel that we are at war because obviously uh, we are being bombarded by other people's images and films. But the Netflix are coming here uh, while we have no way to kind of fight back. Um, we kind of feel abandoned. I'll tell you one thing that happened. I was one time at the EU at a discussion and uh, they asked me, which country are you from? I said, Cameroon. And they said, you know what? It's for you to get a loan, uh, kind of loan or kind of exactly what it was, you need your government to say that culture and cinema is important. Can you find us a speech of the president or something 
that says cinema is important. I look for it. I call all my friends at the ministry. We couldn't find one. And that the conclusion of the EU said, how can we give you a loan or a grant if your country hasn't said cinema is important? So there's no way we can work with you because it's not a priority in your country. So that's what you hear all the time. Uh, it's not a priority. And uh, as Emeka was saying, how much employment is producing, like Nigeria is a really interesting, a really interesting case study. I think Nigeria passed uh, be, uh, South Africa based on cinema. Nigeria became the, the number one African country because in economy because of uh, uh, cinema. So I think it's very important when you look at the context here, every initiative is kind of private, you know, and it's always backed by the West. You know, uh, the initiative you're talking about actually now, I have to go because I have 20 participants right now, uh, because we decide to adapt uh, our African books into films. So because we realize that um, uh, the level of literature is very high and the level of cinema is very low. Uh, and um, we feel that cinema needs, uh, fiction cinema, obviously, fiction films, needs to kind of tap into this uh, potential of literature. So, and this initiative, unfortunately, is funded by the French. You know? um, another initiative, which is related to uh, Black Panthers, uh, is called Fumban is Wakanda. Uh, Fumban is this town uh, in the west side of Cameroon that uh, uh, where you had uh, um, a king who invented an alphabet that many people say is much better than the Chinese one. So uh, when you watch a film like Black Panthers, where the kind of dreaming of having an African country with his own alphabet, I mean, it's not a dream, it happened. So the future we are dreaming about is in the past. You know? And we don't really promote all these things. And uh, it's very hard then to know that we live in a context where what is us? Because culture is us. You know, when I watch a film, and I remember this lady in South Africa telling me that I like watching Nigerian films because for the first time I can see people who look like me. I don't even understand what they're saying, but I would like to eat what they're cooking. I, it seems like their food is very good based on the <laughs> film. So this is really what films do, film does. And I think we don't really realize how much Nigeria has gained, you know, in making us feel more African. Uh, through these Nollywood uh, uh, films. Uh, we, 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 we're so proud now to, to, uh, to be, a very and be very assertive about our African identity, just because at a popular level, we could see with these films that we don't have to wait on European films or American films to really, really identify with people who are not like us. So economically, I think uh, Nigeria has proven it. Uh, unfortunately, I wish... Uh, the same thing that is happening with um, mobile phone, where they kind of organize the sector before the big company comes in, uh, and we still have a local company. I, I wish we could do the same with film, with content, if you call it that way, because the sector was reorganized before the Oral, the MTN came, you know? and the government has been really, really kind of uh, serious about making it happen. But in our case, we have been abandoned to ourselves. Uh, they leave the filmmakers, the musicians, just debating in some of the kind of organization where they kind of proving, they, 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 everybody's saying, look, these people are not structured. And that's why I justify the fact that they abandoned a whole sector. And again, cinema is us, you know, and we cannot abandon what is us. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps add something uh, on this. I found this very interesting, uh, Jean-Pierre, because... Um, that's what they told us all the time in our Portuguese-speaking African countries, the follow-up. We kept on hearing, like, how can we fund if we don't even know how many filmmakers you have, if we don't know what your numbers are. And um, the thing is, like, quite recently, um, almost three years ago, we started the project, but now it's functioning better. We have the network for audiovisual and, and, and film from the follow-up. And it started with friends, like one filmmaker from each country. And we decided we got, we got a small funding, again, from the EU, as you said. And we got the mapping. We, we, we gathered all the information. How many filmmakers do we have? 
we put it on our website. Of course, we struggle because it's something that comes from us. But no one, they said, okay, uh, we don't know how many you are. We say, okay, you have the information on the website. So you cannot continue using those excuses. Mm -hmm. And coincidence or not, last year we got our first film law in Cabo Verde. So people are beginning to hear us. They have to. And then they say, okay, you're few. And then I say, okay, but we have a huge diaspora. So keep on, <laughs> it's, uh, as you said, we're struggling, but we, we punch hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And actually, I'll just say something. But please, excuse me, I have to leave you in five minutes because these people are waiting for me. Can you excuse me? But I want to say something. Uh, every country where cinema has developed, Canada, Quebec mainly, because Quebec has been fighting against the French, the English, Canada, Canada. Uh, you will see that they always have what they call a political cultural, meaning a, a set of law, like you're saying, Samira, a set of law that organizes the sector, you know? But uh, obviously, you realize that we wish that the, 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 the African Union would actually uh, join that whole thing and help if the state cannot do it. Uh, and we have an organization that is linked to the African Union. It's called the FEPASI, Federation Pan-African des Cineastes. I was one of the board members for quite a while, but I resigned because it's useless at the end of the day, sorry. So the idea is that, okay, we have these structures, but uh, we feel that, you know, what is really key, crucial, is not being at least promoted. We don't say that the EU should enforce some uh, state to kind of laws to do this or that, but still, you really feel that is not even kind of of any, any interest, you know? Yeah. So I think... Um, uh, if you don't have this set of laws, you know, uh, where the sector is being organized, uh, the status of the nature, the cameraman, all that, it has to be by, done by the government. There's no way we can expect the people in the sector to do it themselves. You know, when the, 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 the Orange, the MTN, the, this big mobile company came, they didn't ask them to organize themselves. Uh, the sector was organized, and then they could come in, you know. And now in France and other countries, they are making sure that uh, what they call the, the big five, the Google, the... Um, the GAFA, I'm sorry, the Google, the Facebook, pay tax to finance, you know, uh, cinema, uh, and that work, it's working. But what is the African Union doing, for example, to make sure that we can actually ask these people, where, because we're consuming all these things, and it's killing some part of our, sector, our industries, you know, because the, the money is being diverted to them, with the Netflix and everything. So I think somehow we really need to look at what other people who are fighting to keep their cinema, you know, what are they doing? And we should really tap into those strategies, you know? Thank you, Thank so, you, Jean I, so can, I, can I go? I'm sorry, they're waiting for me. So can I leave you? Huh? Oh, maybe so, we can take the organizer, yeah? we can take a picture before Jean-Pierre leaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I hope it's a nice picture. Huh? <laughs> Maybe if you smile. <laughs> I'm giving you my best smile. So. <laughs> okay, Samira, it was nice talking to you. I hope you do it again in Mecca. I hope to nice see you to soon. Nice to meet you. Know? And, and I invite you to come okay. <laughs> You must come care, to Cadbert huh? someday. I will, I will, definitely. So you just invite me. <laughs> yes, you can come. You can come. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs> So we had Jean-Pierre that has just left us, but from what I keep um, from all the comments that you all recently made is that film is a strong vehicle also for economic development, but there are also, there seems to be some geopolitical difference according from the, the place where the filmmakers are coming. Uh, Emeka uh, uh, told us about uh, what happens with Nollywood. Nollywood is big, but my point is, can we actually compare what Nollywood is producing to uh, what is, has been done in India, in America, with you know the, the big uh, American system of uh, all the industry, the big American industry. So there are, there are slightly different that are actually geopolitical in that... Um, maybe impacts huh, the industry of cinema. But now maybe I want us to go deeper because, because I see we, we started a bit late, but for me, we have 10 minutes or what do you think? 10 minutes more or 20? If, as, as you wish, I'm, I'm, I can be yeah, here for another that's day. That's fine, I'm here. Okay. 
Because um, Jean-Pierre said something about the fact that sometimes the legal framework doesn't protect the industry of cinema. But there is, a, I'm a lawyer, and I, I know Emeka is also a lawyer, so there is a UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the D Diversity of Cultural Expression. And I think that film can be like, rely to this convention. So I want us now to go much on cultural identity. So what is cultural identity? How do you reflect cultural identity in your films? I think maybe you heard about the Segu call. Uh, that was a big meeting on, uh, on this topic. And uh, so what do you think? Maybe Emeka can start. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very good point. To be honest with you, a lot of my work has been about the conversations on identity and the impact of either, in, of either intrusions on that identity or indeed the, uh, should I say, responses to restoring identity. So it's always, the whole narrative about my work has been about, look, first of all, you have to know who you are, you know, because one of the problems we faced in Nigeria, particularly in the study of history, uh, was that history was de-emphasized in the school curriculum. Um, about 30, uh, about close to four decades, decades ago. And the impact of the removal of history was that a huge chunk of the learning, the trajectory of learning was removed from the curriculum. Now, even before that, the colonial uh, curriculum was very much tailored towards achieving a particular aim. You were, they were more interested in training and producing a particular kind of individual from the system, clerks, administrative you know, app 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 apparatchiks for the colonial infrastructure. Now, the, for my, I come from an ethnic group called the Igbo people, you know, and, you know, several millions all over the world, you know, and the reality is that so many questions were still emerging about our origins, even in the present. Whereas you, can, you go to the, the Wolofs, the, you know, the Tukolo, the, 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 this is the, where they have strong oral traditions. The Igbos were still struggling to find a common identity, as a common narrative on identity, and which is where film Nollywood had an impact on this reinforcement because there is some of the original Nollywood films. Because if I let me even go into the, the very first Nollywood film was a film called Living in Bondage, which was uh, in Igbo language, which is uh, produced by my good friend, Chris Ubiraku. Now, Igbo language was Igbo culture and identity was trans was transmitted globally through the vehicle of the early Nollywood films, which was now catalyzed. Even though Nollywood now transmitted into English language, but even the way English was spoken in Nollywood films was still very much nuanced towards a an intrinsic indigenous identity. Now, where where am I going with all of this? The fact is that Nollywood is also subject to the distortions because if the his, if you, like, I mean, sometimes I consult, apart from making my films, I actually consult for, for films. And I know that one of the things we try to do is make sure that the historical data, the research is absolutely spot on. Now, when you, as I, I'll use the same analogy, when you are in music composition, you have the, the song, the, the composition starts from a one. If the one is distorted, if you're starting the composition from a two, you can't put something on nothing and it stands. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. that and all that. So the reality is that a lot of the, the narratives in Nollywood productions that focus on the cultural identity were distorted because they were obviously the of creative license. So the responsibility, the only recently has there been a, a greater impetus on historical accuracy in narratives towards at least making sure that whatever identity we are conveying is accurate, and that what we are producing is not more destructive than the distortions that the colonial, uh, colo which we have uh, formed our colonial inheritance. And I'm glad to see that, I mean, there are new films like, um, films like uh, produced by Kunle Afalayan, you know what I mean, uh, October, October 1st and the like, the 1976. These are films that struck a very, a very you know, very, there was a very strict adherence to making sure that the historical narratives were accurate. And that is, Part of the job that we have, even if you're making a feature film, the fact is that in the feature film, at least, that there must be at least be an adherence to 
historical accuracy to cultural accuracy. And that is where our responsibility lies. Because I kept, I used this phrase at the beginning, even though documentary filmmakers are culturally poor, uh, financially poor in Africa, the fact is that you have, as a filmmaker, you have, you possess great power. The power of conveying a narrative that, may, that influences the wider society. So that in exercising that power, there's a great responsibility to make, to know that, look, you're not just representing your artistic whims. You're also representing the, the people with whom you're actually a trustee for the people with whom you seek to communicate with in film. So without question, for us as Africans with our colonial past and the legacy of that colonial past, a, I mean, as Samira very, very, very eloquently uh, articulated earlier on, when she chose to convey uh, uh, her, her film, use the, the, the linguistic vehicle of her film to be in Creole, you know, which is a very bold step because obviously it would have been safer for you to make it in Portuguese. It would have been cheaper for you. In fact, you'd have probably gotten more money, you know. Um, but the thing is that we still have that responsibility, and I think we should not be discouraged by whatever obstacles you know that lie in front of us. And you know, that's that's in summary is my thesis on the uh, on the question. Thank you, thank you, Emeka, for brilliant insight. What do you think, Samir? This is amazing. Gives me a lot to think of, actually. Uh, my mom is a history professor, so I grew up, even in our house, our names were, because in, in the Portuguese culture, all the names in my family were very Catholic. And my mom said, no, our children are African. I'm going to give my children African names. And, and so it's Samira Nandi, Nandi from South Africa, the mother of Chaka Zulu. So mm -hmm. you have all this that came from my house. And I had this privilege of having this sort of information at home because not everyone has it. And, and as I said before, and just a little, Kunle Afolayan comes here to Cap Verde many times and I've had the chance to work with him. And, yeah. and this worry that he has for like this historical knowledge and comprehension and transmission of our tradition in films is very, very important to me. And, and the thing is to understand Cap Verde from its very beginning, the islands had no one. So the Portuguese arrived and they brought uh, people <laughs> who they made slaves. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and these people had their cultures, had their religions, had their different languages, and which is why the Creole from each island differs a little bit. You have the Sampajudo and you have the Badiou, and then each island has a different accent and different uh, uh, expressions because they were populated in different times. So in different times you had more or less slaves or from different regions or from different languages and, and more influence from the French, for instance, uh, and the English in the island where I was born. So you have this culture in itself that is very mixed from the very beginning. And then you have all the colonial past in which different genres of cultural manifestation, such as Tabanka, Batuku, were forbidden. So mm -hmm. they were kind of lost. And you have different generations that took that banner and started doing it. And, and, and there's this um, phrase from this uh, very interesting economist from Kabir Paulino Diaz. He once told me, like our grandparents' generation held the independence banner. Mm -hmm. Our parents' generation had the democracy banner, which is ours. And to me is a lot a question of, again, as you said, who are we? What are we doing here? What is yeah. our history? What do you want to tell? And a lot of the problems we have in society come from this struggle of identity. So film is, is a powerful tool. And when I make films in Creole, I mix some Pajudu and Badiou. I put one person from different islands. So you can see it's not the same. You have people from different colors, different um, uh, economic status. So you can actually see. Because uh, otherwise, like I remember I once went to Portugal and when I was looking for financing for Sucuru, I, I met this big Portuguese producer, amazing man, very nice. And he told me, oh, it's amazing that I get to meet you because my dream is to film in Africa. And I started laughing and, and I, I lost 
because of that, probably if I said, oh, okay, let's do this exotic thing, I would probably get some money. But mm -hmm. I started laughing and I said, from my island to the next island, and we only have like around 500,000 people in my country and that over That's a million abroad. I you laughed, think that I we said. Are we are Sorry. Only, we are two minutes left. I'll wrap it up. So, just so interesting, but maybe yeah. in one, one second, you know, okay. is there any recommendation that we can make? quickly like something to to improve the film as a pillar for sustainable development for africa what can you suggest it's, it's very easy it's just to find a voice to know what we want to tell uh okay. and and push it forward and do it and see the impact that it actually has around us thank you samira yes um in very in in one in one paragraph, you know, first of all, as I'd borrow a leaf from what Samira says, and I'll also add that first of all, get our narratives right, understand our responsibility as filmmakers, and then hopefully that when the governments, you know, will get their fingers out of their ears and understand that this is an industry and it is also a vehicle for national development and mobilization and support it. There has to be that conversation between filmmakers and the government towards a common goal. Maybe then, maybe then and maybe then progress will start. But in the meantime, we'll carry on. We'll keep thank on pushing. <laughs> Indeed. Very interesting. We thank the information. We are making films, we are the films, and we are building the, the future of our continent. It seems that the challenge goes far beyond the national framework, but we are going to work for it in the future. Thank you. Yeah.